Dr. Anand Sakraya is Professor and Head of the Department of Medicine Unit 1 from the batch of 1981 from Christian Medical College, Velo. His area of interest includes medical education and clinical toxicology. He has been instrumental in developing a variety of innovations in undergraduate medical education, clerkship in medicine and surgery, integrated learning program, e-learning, secondary hospital program, and recently the curricular re renewal. He has set up two distance learning education programs, the fellowship in HIV medicine and the PG diploma in family medicine. He has been instrumental in developing toxicology training for remote secondary hospitals through telemedicine. He has over 40 publications and is recipient of multiple grants. To coagulate or to anticoagulate, that is the question. Our journey through the pandemic. The COVID-19 has been the most difficult challenge in my professional life. How to bring whatever little we know to bear on the gravity of the situation of large-scale death. We were faced with a large number of cases, about 9,500 cases in CMC in total, with a mortality of about 5% and 5 to 10 deaths occurring every day at the peak of the pandemic. It was a new disease for which there were no known treatments. The approach of evidence-based medicine encourages us to grade the evidence that we have uh, regarding treatments and choose practice guidelines based on the highest quality of evidence from well-done randomized control trials, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We know that conducting RCTs and performing systematic reviews takes time, many years. In the absence of these, how do we decide practice guidelines based on lower quality of evidence from clinical cases, laboratory studies, and observational data? In choosing an approach to the treatment in the pandemic, the physician has to review the evidence from the literature, examine their own practice, and call on their judgment of what would be the appropriate line of treatment that would benefit their set of patients, keeping in mind the basic tenets of the Hippocratic Oath, do good and do no harm. In my presentation, I will first review the relevant literature and then take you through our CMC experience, our journey of anticoagulation in COVID-19. In the respiratory failure of COVID-19, there is direct viral cytopathic effect resulting in diffuse alveolar damage. This is followed by inflammation in the lung involving the innate immunity with activation of the endothelium. This leads to inflammation, microthrombosis, and problems of microcirculation, all these leading to respiratory failure. This is a conceptual framework of the pathogenesis of COVID-19 pneumonia. The evidence for the prothrombotic state in COVID-19 includes elevated D-dimer, FTPs, fibrinogen, a normal or slightly prolonged PT, APTT, and a normal or slightly decreased platelet count. There is also evidence of increased plasma viscosity, factor VIII and von Willebrand factor levels, decrease in antithrombin activity and free protein S, and increase in protein C activity. There is pathological evidence of pulmonary thrombosis. An autopsy on 11 patients showed presence of diffuse alveolar damage and thrombosis in small and mid-sized pulmonary arteries in all patients. Also, alveolar capillary microthrombi were nine times as prevalent in patients with COVID-19 as in patients with influenza. 
In an observational study of venous thromboembolism in 198 patients with COVID-19, there was an incremental, incremental increase in the incidence of VTE. And at three weeks, 42% had VTE and 25% had symptomatic VTE. In the ICU, the corresponding figures were 59% and 34% compared to 9.2% in non-ICU patients. In a systematic review of the incidence of venous thromboembolism of 17 studies involving 1,913 patients, the estimated incidence of VT was 25%. Severe patients had a 3.76-fold increased risk of VT compared to non-severe patients. And high rates of pharmacological thromboprophylaxis of more than 60% was associated with a lower incidence of VTE. In a systematic review of heparin prophylaxis in COVID-19, eight studies in 2,946 patients, prophylactic heparin was not associated with any change in mortality. However, there was a positive effect of prophylactic heparin on patients of moderate severity COVID-19 with elevated D-dimer. In three studies, observational studies of therapeutic anticoagulation, two showed mortality benefit with intermediate anticoagulation and therapeutic anticoagulation, and one showed that both prophylactic and therapeutic heparin had lower mortality than control, although there was no statistically significant difference between therapeutic and prophylactic anticoagulation. In a systematic review of therapeutic anticoagulation of 16 studies, there was statistically significant association between anticoagulation and mortality. Both therapeutic and prophylactic anticoagulation were associated with lower risk of mortality and prophylactic anticoagulation was associated with a higher risk of mortality compared to therapeutic anticoagulation. In the only phase two clinical trial called HESA-COVID, uh, comparing therapeutic versus prophylactic anticoagulation with 10 patients in each arm, therapeutic heparin was associated with a faster improvement in PF and faster liberation from the ventilator. This was a small study and did not look at mortality. Further such studies are required. Examining the issue of bleeding with anticoagulation, in one study, major bleeding occurred in 3% with therapeutic anticoagulation versus 1.7% on prophylactic anticoagulation and 1.9% with those with no anticoagulation. In another study, there were four systemic bleedings, which were all retroperitoneal, observed in 182 patients receiving intermediate anticoagulation, 2.2%. And three out of the four patients had concomitant antiplatelet therapy. To summarize the review of the literature, laboratory studies demonstrate that COVID-19 is a pro-thrombotic state. There is increased risk of venous thrombosis in COVID-19. There is pathological evidence of pulmonary microthrombosis. This may be contributing to the hypoxemia. Observational studies show benefit of both prophylactic and therapeutic anticoagulation in reducing mortality. Some observational studies and one small phase two study showed that therapeutic anticoagulation may be more beneficial than prophylactic in severe and critically ill patients. And prophylactic and therapeutic anticoagulation have low risk of systemic bleeding. In the second part of my talk, I will be speaking about our journey with anticoagulation. <clears throat> we started off with an anticoagulation guideline, which I will refer to as guideline one, which was an evidence-based approach, and I'll refer to it as a conservative approach. Our laboratory studies suggested the presence of a thrombotic tendency and endotheliopathy. Our clinical studies through audits and case reports showed a high mortality in COVID-19 in severely and critically ill patients and the occurrence of venous thromboembolism despite anticoagulation. At about this time, the treatment group changed its guidelines to an anticoagulation guideline two, which I would refer to as a liberal anticoagulation reflecting changes in trends across the world. All these together, our clinical data and the new guideline 
forced us to change anticoagulation practice. Subsequently, we audited this and did a survey among our doctors and I'll talk about the impact of these. In the anticoagulation guideline one, in asymptomatic patients or mild symptomatic prophylactic anticoagulation may be administered if patients have at least one risk factor for VTE. In moderate, severe and critically ill patients, prophylactic anticoagulation and therapeutic anticoagulation may be for either confirmed DVT or PE or a consistent clinical picture. We started a study with hepatology department on the reticuloendothelial system activation in COVID-19. Uh, this involved 153 patients where we studied biochemical markers of reticuloendothelial activation uh, and studied its relation to the severity of disease and mortality. Univated analysis showed that admission D-dimer and VWF were associated with severity of disease and mortality. And multivariate analysis showed that both D day one D-dimer and VWF were correlated with disease severity and day one VWF was the only factor that predicted in hospital survival. In conclusion, in our study in COVID-19 patients, we showed evidence of endothelial activation and thrombin generation. And this study supported the concept of microthrombosis and endotheliopathy that they may have a central role in the pathogenesis of COVID-19 pneumonia. About this time, we did an audit of mortality in Medicine One patients. And in the month of July, out of 157 patients, the overall mortality was 5%, 25% in the severe group and 50% in the critical group. We also looked at mortality in the severe and critical group over the months of May to July in 30 patients. And we found a mortality of 33.3% in severe group and 57.1% in the critical group. After excluding the non-escalation patients, the still the mortality in the critical group was 40%. We also showed evidence of venous thromboembolism in multiple cases. A 63-year-old with critical COVID-19 who received therapeutic anticoagulation for 21 days, followed by prophylactic anticoagulation, developed saddle pulmonary embolism, which was thrombolyzed and the patient survived. Another 65-year-old patient with critical COVID on therapeutic anticoagulation, developed DVT on day 12 and died. And a 71-year-old patient with past history of DVT and pulmonary embolism who was recovering from critical COVID-19 pneumonia on therapeutic anticoagulation developed DVT on day 30. We also had five cases of stroke and three cases of acute coronary syndrome. A 75-year-old person who presented with COVID pneumonia developed sudden onset of hemiparesis and drop in sensorium on day 6 with a cerebellar infarct and this patient died. Another patient with malignant MCA stroke was found to have asymptomatic COVID, which developed into a pneumonia in the ward, and this patient died. Another patient who presented with severe COVID pneumonia developed an instemy in the ward and was discharged. And two other patients who presented with STEMI were diagnosed with asymptomatic COVID, and in hospital, both of them developed massive stroke. Uh, about this time, the treatment group issued its new anticoagulation strategy, what I refer to as anticoagulation guideline one. In the mild group, the recommendation was same as guideline one. But in the moderate group, recommended therapeutic anticoagulation if thromboembolism is suspected. And in the severe group, intermediate dose anticoagulation risk factors for thrombotic disease are present or the D-dimer is elevated and therapeutic anticoagulation if thromboembolism is suspected. And in the critical group, give intermediate dose anticoagulation and therapeutic dose anticoagulation if risk factors for thrombotic disease present and therapeutic anticoagulation if thromboembolism is suspected. The definitions of prophylactic and therapeutic anticoagulation in the prophylactic group in oxyparin, sub-Q, 40 MD, sub -Q BD, or delta parin, on fractionated heparin, 5,000 units, sub -Q BD. And intermediate anticoagulation dose less than 80 kilos uh, in oxyparin, 40 MG, sub -Q BD, or more than 80 kilos, 60 MG, BD, or delta parin. And in therapeutic anticoagulation, in oxyparin, 1 MG per kilo, sub -Q BD, or delta parin. 
And you have to keep in mind the contraindications for anticoagulation, which are bleeding diathesis, such as a platelet count of less than 20,000. Our clinical experience of high mortality and the occurrence of VT despite anticoagulation and the change in treatment guidelines forced us to change our practice in relation to anticoagulation. We advocated multiple interventions in seriously sick patients to reduce mortality, including an early initiation of dexamethasone, remdesivir, intermediate or therapeutic anticoagulation based on guidelines, awake proning, and NIV. We followed this up with an audit uh, of Medicine One patient, an anticoagulation audit. Uh, we reviewed 97 charts out of 353 for the months of July to August. 100% of moderate illness were on prophylactic anticoagulation. 41.7% of severe illness were on intermediate or therapeutic anticoagulation. And 87.9% of critical illness were on intermediate or therapeutic anticoagulation, reflecting that we were following the new guidelines. There was no bleeding in the prophylactic anticoagulation and one minor bleed hematuria in the intermediate and therapeutic anticoagulation. In a survey of anticoagulation practice among 64 consultants in the COVID ward, the consensus emerging in our consultants was for routine prophylactic anticoagulation in mild COVID with risk factors for VT or moderate COVID without risk factors for VT and intermediate or therapeutic anticoagulation in moderate COVID with risk factors for VT or severe and critical COVID consistent with the new guidelines. Lastly, most recently, we did an audit of COVID-19 receiving NIV in the key ICU, which is the NIV only ICU. Among 30 patients under Medicine One admitted in case ICU between uh, the months of <coughs> August to September, all patients received dexamethasone and remdesivir. All of them received intermediate or therapeutic anticoagulation. And the mortality rate in this group was 7%, 2 on 30. One death occurred due to retroperitoneal hematoma, which occur occurred in a 65-year-old lady on dual antiplatelet therapy and therapeutic anticoagulation despite transfusion and lumbar artery embolization. The low death rate in Medicine One key ICU audit is very striking. This could be partly due to patients requiring only an IV who were less severe and had better outcomes being admitted in key ICU. This could also be due to overall improvements in management, such as earlier initiation of remdesivir, DEXA, NIV, and anticoagulation strategies. So I'll summarize our journey so far. We started off with a conservative evidence-based approach, that is anticoagulation one. Our clinical experience showed the presence of high mortality in severe and critically ill patients. With multiple case reports of pulmonary embolism, DVT, and arterial thrombosis despite anticoagulation. Our laboratory studies supported the concept of thrombotic tendency and endotheliopathy. We needed to change our practice to reduce mortality. Our treatment group changed the anticoagulation guidelines. We decided to initiate multiple changes in our treatment protocol uh, in our unit to identify serious cases early, initiate remdesivir, DEXA, NIV, and the new anticoagulation guidelines. We performed audits and surveys to demonstrate that doctors are following the new anticoagulation guidelines. And our recent audit suggests a fall in mortality in carefully selected group of critically ill patients. These improvements in mortality could be due to better experience with the disease, overall improvements in care, and the combination of treatments that we initiated. The role of anticoagulation strategies in this improvement in mortality is unclear. However, the risk of systemic bleeding with intermediate and therapeutic anticoagulation is low. Our last case report shows that serious bleeding can take place with therapeutic anticoagulation on antiplatelet therapy and can cause death. So while we advocate a liberal approach to anticoagulation, we need to follow the contraindication strictly and carefully review and make decisions on a case-by-case -case manner. So I would like to conclude by say, stating the need for a pragmatic approach to evidence-based medicine 
in a pandemic. In the situation of a pandemic where there is insufficient knowledge to guide treatment practice, we have to review the research evidence study our clinical practice through case documentation, audits, observational and laboratory studies, and use our clinical judgment in developing therapeutic guidelines and training approach. Our approach so far with COVID-19 shows that such an approach can be dynamic, rich in learning, change practice, and reduce death rates in the pandemic. Thank you.